Good afternoon, um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to uh, the next presentation. And this will be on uh, mobile broadband. Uh, absolutely exciting development, of course, with everybody here with smartphones in their pockets and tablets and things like that. It's clear that, uh, you know, mobile broadband is um, one of those phenomenal developments that has happened in our industry uh, over um, a relatively short period of time. A um, couple of things. Uh, I'm sending out a weekly email on Tuesdays, and if you are interested in receiving that free of charge, then uh, Julie is um, uh, scanning your tag and you get that um, get it from us. You also see a few um, barco um, QR codes around and um, that gives you access to our mobile site and the Android app and there you will find free presentations of uh, what we're doing here at CBIT and background information on uh, the topics that um, we are talking about. So if you're interested in that uh, free of charge, uh, feel free to um, go to the mobile, uh, to the web app on mobile or the Android uh, application. The iPhone application is underway, but um, Apple being a monopoly, it now takes much longer to get applications into iTunes. And um, so we're still waiting for that to happen. Uh, once that's happening in the next few days, there's also an, uh, an iPhone app. Okay, let's go into um, the uh, mobile broadband uh, network, uh, the mobile broadband uh, developments, uh, and what we basically are seeing happening with mobile broadband is that it becomes more and more integrated with the fixed network. Uh, you know, now we're still talking about a mobile network and a fixed network, and there is even discussion uh, about, um, you know, ca can't we all do it with uh, mobile? Why do we need um, the fixed network at all? Um, however, I think most people will um, appreciate that um, um, uh, these two will be in parallel, but increasingly it will also integrate. Because if you already, uh, for example, uh, look at um, London, where they've got the Olympics next month, uh, British Telecom put in the LTE mobile network they put in 70,000, 70, 77,000 mobile stations to cover the LTE and every single one of them is linked to the fiber optic network. So you really start seeing that uh, a mobile network is to a very large extent a fiber optic network with only the last little bit between the mobile tower uh, and yourself basically being the mobile end. The rest is all fixed network. Yeah? Uh, the other element, of course, is that if you use your smartphone and your tablet, then uh, for 85% of the mobile broadband time, uh, mobile broadband time that you use, 85% is taking place while you're at home, in the office, or in an internet cafe. And in other words, it's linked to your Wi-Fi network and goes directly into the into your ADSL or HFC uh, fixed line connection. So while you are using a mobile phone. In all reality, yeah, for mobile broadband uh, use, yeah, you actually are using the fixed network. 65% yeah? of tablets don't even have a mobile connection. It's only Wi-Fi, yeah. And Wi-Fi again, yeah, some people don't quite get it, but Wi-Fi, of course, is not mobile. In the sense, it's not using the mobile network. Yeah, Wi-Fi is free, getting into your fixed network, and that's how uh, how you use that uh, that network. So there are two reasons for that. One is that if you would use um, the sort of mobile broadband applications on the mobile network, the network will collapse. And we saw that with Vodafone and how much problems they still have yeah, with the network simply because of an overload, a meltdown of the network because of the enormous uh, use of smartphones, which of course was never envisaged by any of the mobile operators to the extent that it's happening. So it's the physics of the mobile network, the law of physics tells you there is a limitation in spectrum. You cannot use this, that spectrum for all the broadband use that we want to use. We do need to fix network for that purpose. And also, the first thing that you do uh, in situations like that, you're not going to voluntarily use the mobile network to sit there for a couple of hours downloading uh, stuff on the mobile network because it also hits your hip pocket 
because you're going to pay quite a lot of money for, uh, for that sort of stuff. So there are several reasons why you are using the fixed network even in a situation where you use a mobile phone or a mobile tablet in that, um, in that respect. So mobile and fixed are going very, very closely together, are very much intertwined and are very much uh, uh, in parallel and are not competing with each other. So we already see that by 2015 we will have 4 billion mobile users uh, uh, around the world. So there are 7 billion people in the world, so you really start seeing the enormous impact that the mobile phone has. Now if you go to Africa, if you go to most of Asia, if you go to most of South America, there are no fixed networks. Only if you're lucky in the major towns. But apart from that, there are no and definitely not quality. So there's no way that you have a quality network in that sort of uh, countries. India, for example, 60% mobile phone penetration, 7% fixed penetration. So you really start seeing the enormous uh, differences there. So the, mo the broadband experience for most people in the world will be via mobile, not via fixed. Yeah? So that's quite an interesting thing that you have to consider if you start thinking about um, the impact that, uh, that uh, mobile uh, has in, um, in, in the world. Um, you now start seeing that, uh, that $80 smartphones now available in India. Yeah? So you really start seeing that the next step fro up from the traditional mobile phones, which are $10, $15 in those countries, you know, are now going to the smartphones. They want to bring that price down. The Indian government is pushing that. They want to bring the price down to similar prices that you now pay for your mobile phone. So you really start seeing the impact that this will have on uh, countries like, uh, like that. Because suddenly that phone makes you, opens up the world uh, to you uh, through the internet uh, and broadband uh, applications uh, to, uh, to anybody else in the world. Um, the other thing that you see happening is that the networks are uh, becoming pipe operators. Uh, you know, if you uh, look at the um, development of, uh, of smartphones, you could say that the first smartphones started to arrive in 96, 97, when the so-called web protocol was invented. And that gave you actually access on your 2G, 2G phone, the previous generation phone, to the internet. But what did the mobile operators do? They monopolized that. You uh, had to go to their portal for content, and content providers had to pay 80% of the revenue to the mobile operator for the privilege of making that content available on their uh, network. Guess what happened? Nobody was using it. Then uh, Apple arrived in 2007, and in one year, the iPhone took over that whole market. And at that point in time, the mobile operators lost the future of mobile content and mobile apps and things like that. Up till that time, up till 2007, the decision, your decision was made, I'm going with Telstra, I'm going with Virgin, I'm going with Optus, I'm going with Vodafone. Now your decision is, I want this mobile, this smartphone, who has the cheapest price, yeah? So it's a whole shift in power, who has the power? So the power is no longer with the mobile companies, and therefore the mobile companies are becoming pipe operators, yeah? And pipe in this situation, of course, a little bit, um, uh, uh, in, in, in uh, quotation marks because it's the pipe in the sky in that respect. That's why you see that Optus and Vodafone now have this sharing arrangement with, with infrastructure because, because they are pipe operators, therefore utilities, therefore low uh, revenues, their ARPUs are not increasing, they now have to start saving costs and you save costs by sharing infrastructure. Yeah? Uh, that makes it, makes it much, much cheaper to do so. So you see it, a shift in the network operators in that respect, and you also start seeing that merging of, uh, of these networks start creating a monopoly. Let's say that look three, four, five years further, and Vodafone and Optus have totally merged their infrastructure. You only have two players in the market on the infrastructure, and you start getting very, very close 
to the situation that we had with Telstra five years ago, uh, where they monopolized the market. So I wouldn't be surprised that in five years' time or ten years' time, there will be structurally separation in mobile networks as well, and you get a separation between the infrastructure and uh, the content and the services. So networks are going to uh, are undergoing quite significant changes. It's not too late for them to change, but if history tells us anything, you know, they have been very, very poor in adopting to value-added services. Yeah? They are good engineers, they're good in, uh, in, in, in network design and things like that, nothing wrong with that, but as soon as it comes to customer interfaces, as soon as it comes to uh, customer service applications, the, the, the telephone companies are not the best marketeers. You know, the Googles of this world, the Microsoft of this world, the, the Apples of this world, the Facebooks, that are the, the new uh, 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 companies that are connecting to us, the retailers, to us, the, the customers. An interesting application, an interesting development last week where uh, Telstra decided to make um, uh, um, recharge of their mobile prepaid phones available over Facebook. So now they're using Facebook as a telco, an over-the-top service for their, for their own development. So you start seeing that companies such as Telstra are going to make more and more services available over the top, basically utilizing what they so far have, have called their competitors, Google, Facebook, Amazon, etc. Yeah? So it's a total shift in strategic thinking about you know, what's happening on the retail side of telecommunication services where you see this change happening in that uh, market. The other thing is that I just mentioned those portals. So in 2007, the iPhone arrived. By 2008, they had wiped the mobile portal market of the market. In other words, they made more money, iPhone made more money than all the 500 portals of the mobile operators in the world together within one year. Yeah? Then the next thing, and then 95% and then of all the apps are free of charge. Only 5% of the apps are charged for. So you see the enormous change happening in that particular area. The biggest change that has happened since is that the majority of the money made in this new environment is made within the app, not by downloading the app for 99 cents, but once you're in the app, the sort of things that you actually can do, upgrading, buying, etc., etc. Yeah. So that's another basic change that, uh, that has happened. So it, the app has become another utility, yeah? another over-the-top utility that is available for uh, the retail market. So the money is increasingly being made on top of the network rather than on the network itself. And that's why you see that the mobile operators can't increase their ARPU. People are not prepared to pay more for access, but people are prepared to pay extra money when the, once they're in the app or when they start downloading apps. So there's a whole shift taking place in the, in the value chain of that happening and in the power of who is making the money in that particular area. Over the top services are now largely replacing uh, SMS, are largely replacing um, uh, um, uh, uh, emails, etc. Yeah. If you've got the young generation, you know, the, 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 the kids between, let's say, 10 and 20 years old, yeah? They are not using SMS to that extent anymore. They still use it, but very limited. And if they use it, they use what apps and not SMS. And, uh, of course, they are using uh, the Facebook to send emails and no longer, you know, the, uh, the ordinary uh, email. So you really see the shift happening that a lot of what were telecommunication services are now over-the-top services and are delivered by others rather than the uh, telecom and the telecoms operator. Skype, of course, is another classical service that fits into that, te tel in that category. So you see that the new telcos of the world are actually the Facebooks, the Googles, the Skypes, etc. Yeah? Skype has more customers, more telecommunication customers than any telco in the world. Yet they operate that with 3% of the operational cost of uh, the telcos. 3%. Yeah? Not 20% cheaper or 80% cheaper, yeah? 97% cheaper than a telco. So you see that operating a network 
is going to be shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and has to, you know, you have to reduce the cost there enormously in order to start competing with what's happening on top of the, on top of the network. Attention visitors. The presentation by Ms. the first Sheila, the Chief Technology Officer from Cloud Control, has been cancelled for today. If you would like to see his presentation, you will be able to at 1.30 tomorrow at the Cloud Theatre in Hall 4. Spectrum, of course, remains a major, uh, a major issue. As I mentioned before, uh, there is a, uh, uh, there's the law of physics that applies to spectrum. Um, there is simply not enough spectrum, for example, to do what um, some people on the political side, you know, like Malcolm Turbin are saying, you know, we don't need fiber, it can all be done on, on wireless. Simply not possible, yeah? So spectrum is a key issue. And also, what we are going to use in spectrum is for far more uh, quality spectrum, high capacity spectrum, which only have a very small reach. So in other words, if we increase the amount of capacity on the network because we want to use mobile broadband and mobile applications, you actually have to establish, you have to uh, set up many more uh, base stations to such an extent that you basically need a base station on every house if you really would like to um, operate a wireless network in that sort of a situation. And there is simply not enough spectrum for that. And the, the size, of the, the quality of the applications can only be guaranteed if you go into the high frequency in the area closer to the mobile towers where you operate. So there is a significant problem in uh, the spectrum area. So it's good that we see the, um, the, the freeing of spectrum that's coming available from analog television by 2013 but already the mobile operators are saying that's not enough yeah so we are already running out of spectrum that we even don't have yeah the spectrum that's not available today we already have run out to such an extent that the companies are prepared to pay five billion dollars for the available spectrum that we have that is becoming available over the next couple of years. So, you know, again, that clearly shows the problems that we have in wireless spectrum and the way the spectrum operates. I think also there, you really start seeing that you cannot afford to have three, four, five different operators having different sets of the spectrum. You know, we need to start sharing spectrum more and more and more in order to satisfy the demand that we have for spectrum. Obviously, innovations will come, we can, make, we can use spectrum more efficiently as before, but that's not keeping up with the demand in spectrum that is needed. So there will be an ongoing problem for the next 10, 20 years yeah, in relation to a spectrum. There's not a short-term solution for that. So we really need to have a much more different spectrum um, regime and ECMA, or the Australian uh, Communication Media Authority, uh, is one of the leading regulators, radio spectrum regulators in the world. So the Australian regulator is, is quite often asked by other countries in the world talking about the spectrum plan that we have it in Australia, that they are developing for Australia. So we are in good hands, but nevertheless, you know, what's not there is not there. You can't use that, yeah? And if you go into the, into the uh, uh, highest, higher frequencies, you know, the problem is that you know, we, we, um, we need to be very close to it. And that's the example that I just gave you. The 70,000 base stations in, uh, in London gives you an idea of, uh, of the problems that, um, that are happening in that, uh, in that area. Again, you know, um, because it's such a political discussion in Australia that we don't need um, the fiber network and you only need um, wireless, yeah? I mean, wireless, the smartphone, the tablet is the killer application for fiber to the home. Because if you have your two or three smartphones and tablets and laptops and your smart television around the corner and you all want to pump that through your nice ADSL connection and the Wi-Fi connection in your house, you will shortly run out of capacity. You see already a massive upgrade in households from $50 packages to $70 or $100 packages simply because the household cannot, cannot um, 
um, doesn't have enough cap capacity within the broadband capacity that was good enough, let's say, a year or two years ago. So you really start seeing the bottleneck is becoming in the network in your home uh, in order where all those so-called mobile devices are used, yeah, in order to actually pump that through the fixed network, you know, you need that. So the biggest, ch the biggest driver for fiber to the home will be the fact that you and I are going to com com the com complain about the slow access that we are going to get on our fixed broadband network because we now are using all those smart devices in the house. Now add to that the smart network, uh, smart grid network from the electricity companies and your fridge will be connected and your, uh, your washing machine will be connected and start adding all of that together and you start seeing that the house is becoming a bottleneck in uh, the capacity that's needed for the various applications that, um, that's there. So uh, you already see, um, and, and some of you might already have that, I have it already in our house, you've got Wi-Fi wi uh, repeaters, yeah? So within the house you have already, you start increasing the network because of all the devices that are, new, are now used in all sorts of different places, yeah? And the next thing, of course, is the gigabyte uh, Wi-Fi available, uh, slowly becoming available now, and that starts addressing some of the problems, of course, for the house, but eventually, you know, it still ends up with the pipe that needs to be adjusted um, as well. So limited capacity will always mean in a mobile network caps. You cannot have a mobile network without caps because of the fact that there is limited, uh, only limited uh, capacity. And because somebody asked me a question for this, LTE is not going to change customers' behavior. The reason why I'm saying that is that uh, customers don't give a damn how you deliver broadband. If you deliver it in a wheelbarrow, they will say thank you very much. They don't ask for LTE, they don't ask for fiber, they don't ask for ADSL 2+, plus. they can't even pronounce it. So, you know, they're not asking for that, but they want to use these applications, yeah? So the customer behavior is, you know, I can't use my smartphone or my tablet anymore. I've got problems with downloading, uh, you know, talking on Skype. You know, that are the problems that are indicating to us engineers that they have to make changes uh, to the technology and that's then where LTE, for example, comes in. Um, of course, it's also important to highlight the difference between mobile broadband and wireless broadband. Mobile broadband is what you get on your smartphone and you can walk around and you still have it. Wireless broadband is what you already start ha ha having in uh, some parts of Australia, but what NBN is rolling out, and that is a fixed wireless connection uh, in 7% of the country that doesn't get the fiber to the, node, fiber to the home network. So those people get basically a modem in the house that's not connected to the cable, which is connected to an, an Wi-Fi, of an LT, sorry, an LTE signal that's coming through the wireless network. Uh, when you're in the house, you still need your wireless Wi-Fi connection to walk around with devices is that. So the wireless, fixed wireless connection is not a mobile connection. You can't take it with you in the car. You can't go to the neighbors and have the same connection, etc. Yeah. So there's a huge difference between wireless broadband and about uh, fixed broadband. The, the fixed broadband in Australia is, fixed wireless broadband in Australia is over-designed by NBN Co. Because one of the problems with all mobile is it's shared. It's a shared resource. The more people are on it, the weaker the signal, the, 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 the worse your, your, the, 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 the quality of the signal is. So if you want to provide a good quality broadband network, let, no, let's take the other way around. So if you have a mobile network, then the, mob, the design of the network will base that, let's say 10 or 20% of the people are using the mobile phone in that cell all at the same time. Yeah? And when suddenly 30, 40% are using it, you get the, the meltdown of the network. What NBNCO is doing, they are saying, we are building a cell, a wireless, fixed wireless cell for 100 people, for example, and we create capacity for 100 people simultaneously being on the network. So not 10%, but a much higher percentage, and therefore, even when everybody is on the, in that cell, is on the broadband connection, you still have a good quality. So that's how they are, are telling us 
that they get that people on the wireless fixed wireless network have a quality of broadband that will equal to not the same equal to what people get in uh, in metropolitan areas on the fiber to the fiber to the home network don't tell that to the rural communities that i visit because all of them want fiber yeah all of them say paul great story i don't believe you how do i get fiber to my community we want fiber and you see now literally dozens of communities are putting money on the table to NBNCO and say if we come to the party can you bring fiber to our uh, uh, village houses community uh, rather than that we rely on um, on fixed wireless so it's amazing that still some people and we had an, an, an engineer this morning from Optus who absolutely adamantly said you don't need fiber to the home wireless can do everything yeah now if that person would go to the central coast where I was last week or to Central Victoria, uh, you know, a couple of months ago, he would be stoned because the people there are all asking, we want, what can we do to get fiber? Interestingly, in, uh, it started in uh, Norway. It's now happening in Norway, in the Netherlands, in New Zealand. It's called um, Fiber to the Farm, and where the farmer is digging the trench uh, and that the, the, the fiber company only has to put in the, in the fiber. It started in Stavanger, in Norway, where people wanted fiber to the home and there was no business model for it and then the local telephone company said if you guys pay for the for the trench then we come and roll the fiber out so you really start seeing that uh, you know people are already voting with their feet yeah and are saying you know we want to have uh, fiber uh, we want the best the best possible um, best possible um, quality broadband that that there is so it will be very difficult for politicians to go back to these people and say no, 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 you don't get fiber, you all have to do it on wireless. People already start understanding that. Interestingly, Central Victoria is national party territory. There was not one person out of the 400 decision makers that I met, that I met who said, Paul, we don't want the NBN. And they were national party people, yeah? So they are part of the coalition who actually don't like the NBN. But people on the, on the ground, yeah, they have a good understanding. They know what they want, yeah? They understand how important it is for their community, for their health care, for their education, you know, they, uh, they very clearly understand the, uh, the opportunities there. So thank you very much.